What's going on, smart people? In five days, I take my final exam for quantum mechanics. It's my second semester of quantum. One thing that I realized about that is it's kind of appropriate because this is my last physics exam of undergrad. You know, you watch all these popular science shows growing up and then you picture quantum mechanics being like the epitome of physics. Like it doesn't get higher than that. So it just feels kind of appropriate that being the last exam of my physics undergraduate career anyways. So I thought it'd be kind of fun to reflect on what those two classes in quantum mechanics were actually like. First off, I always remember the Schrodinger equation looking like the coolest equation. I, I didn't know what it meant but it looked cool. Do you guys have any equations that you're like, I have no idea what it stands for, or you didn't know what it stood for, but it just it was really aesthetic to you? That was the Schrodinger equation for me for some reason. I'd be in some gen ed and accidentally flip to the page of my modern physics notebook that had like Schrodinger equation stuff on it, and just be like, oh, sorry, it didn't, uh, you, you saw that, so embarrassing. But quantum one really was just a class in how to use it. One of my favorite things about quantum one was that it really inserted context into linear algebra for me because I took a course in linear and I did well in it, but I didn't know what I was doing when I was doing these linear transformations and things like that. So putting quantum in the context of operators acting on like eigenfunctions or eigenstates and realizing that it's just a linear transformation, like it really made linear algebra all come together and make sense for me. It also offered a different way of looking at the Schrodinger equation. It's not just a second order partial differential equation, but it's an eigenvalue problem. So I guess the biggest thing that came out of quantum one for me was that linear algebra became more intuitive. And this is kind of embarrassing, but I also r distinctly remember when I first realized why we normalize uh, eigenfunctions in the first place. For those of you who don't know, uh, if you're given a wave function, there's normally some constant attached to it. And what you're supposed to do with that constant is you're supposed to integrate the wave function, the, well, the modulus squared of the wave function. So you take the complex part times the uh, real part of the wave function, and you integrate that over the bounds that you're looking at. And you set that equal to 1, and you solve for the constant that makes that whole integral equal 1. And for some reason, when I first started learning quantum, it might have been, honestly, in modern physics, not necessarily just my actual course in quantum, but I didn't really know why it was important to normalize your wave functions. And I don't know who put it into perspective for me, but then once you learn, well, it's so that when you add up all of your probabilities, you know, you, your wave function corresponds to the probability that a particle exists at a certain point. And when you add up all of those probabilities, well, there's a 100% probability that it's somewhere. So making sure that that probability adds up to, the, to one is the whole point of normalizing a wave function in the first place. But depending on how your professor articulates what you're doing, if your professor is more mathematical, they might just go through it as like a math exercise, being like, this is a thing that we do. You'd normalize wave functions. So for some reason, it, it didn't really click with me right away why that was important. But I just distinctly remember that being like a big moment for me, being like, that's why we do it. Okay, now I can move on. I guess this video is more so pointing out epiphanies that I've had in quantum mechanics. Uh, another one being when I started understanding the whole point of commuting operators. And what that is, is it's essentially taking two operators. I don't, it doesn't really matter if you know what an operator is at this point. But it's seeing what happens when you do A, B minus B, A. So do they commute? And if it equals zero, then yes, they commute. That means it doesn't matter which order you take them in. And you can go through the motions of like commuting two operators and seeing what's left over. But no one really explained to me what it meant when you had something left over. And it was a really big moment for me when I realized uh, when you commute two operators, all it does is it lets you know if you can make simultaneous measurements of both of those observables that they correspond to. Famous example is position and momentum. Those two operators do not commute. And in doing so, that means that you can't both measure the position and the momentum of a particle at the same time. And that's why it's so cool when things do commute, like the z component of angular momentum and angular momentum squared. So that was a big thing for me, was uh, finally understanding commutators. But one of the big things with quantum was that it was always such a feat to actually be able to uh, explain physically what it is that you just did whenever you solved the problem. So you'd go through the work, because sometimes it wouldn't be all that hard to go through the motions of doing the math. But then you take a step back and be like, what the hell does any of this mean? 
Because when you're dealing with things like just Dirac notation, commutators, different indices, it's, it could be really easy to get lost in the math and forget that you're explaining something physical. And then you get to like second semester quantum where you're still doing all this stuff, uh, but then you have to start approximating certain things. So you start learning perturbation theory, variational methods, all that good stuff. So you take the abstract math and then you start approximating it. And at, at certain points, you're just like... So I guess quantum was the class that it wasn't the most mathematically demanding. I would think uh, maybe E&M or classical mechanics was more mathematically demanding and hard to actually solve the problems. Uh, but quantum was the one where I had to work the hardest to paint a picture in my head of what I was doing. And I think I've said that about 40 times in this video so far. What blows my mind though is how much more there still is. Not even, and that's not even just stuff that still is to be solved. There's just so much more deeper quantum that people have already figured out, but was too much for an undergraduate to wrap their head around so they don't teach it. So that's, it's exciting and also a little bit terrifying to know that you go through two semesters of quantum and you've barely scraped the surface. You know, you spend two semesters talking about quantizing particles and then someone brings up, hey, but electromagnetism talks about an electric field. Do you have to quantize that? And then you talk about the whole new field of quantum electrodynamics. So there's just, it's really cool how much more there is. But I think I've talked about quantum enough for the day. If you've taken it, let me know in the comments section what your impression of quantum mechanics was. And I'll see you guys there.